This is episode number 137 of the Guns Magazine podcast. Hi there, and welcome to the Guns Magazine podcast. I'm your host and the editor of Guns Magazine, Brent Wheat. Thanks for joining us as we talk to the interesting folks who make up the world of shooting, hunting, and the firearms industry. But first, before we get started, let's have a quick chat about our sponsor, Luth AR. Luth AR is home of MBA buttstocks, which are affordable, lightweight, fully adjustable buttstocks for your AR-15 fixed and collapsible rifles. But that's not all. Luth AR is your one-stop shop for build kits, replacement parts, and custom accessories, including the chubby grip, palm hand guards, oversized switch safety, and paddle bolt catch. Luth AR is proudly made in the USA, and with four decades of experience, they'll continue their mission of innovate to dominate with high-quality products for your ARs. Find out more at luthar.com. Today, I don't have a guest because I'm going to discuss a few thoughts from a major recent life event, my knee replacement surgery. This isn't strictly a gun-related topic, at least until you stop to realize lots of our listeners are facing the same thing due to age and having lived an adventurous life. That means if you want to get back to the shooting range or hunting field, knee replacement is something to consider, and I'll offer my unvarnished opinion on the matter while I'm still in the middle of it. Here we go with knee replacement, what I wish I had known. I wanted to share something today that might seem utterly personal and not really relevant to the greater audience, but after talking it over with our team here at work, everybody agreed it is relevant and more importantly, might help some other folks in the same situation. So here we go. Today, I'm going to talk about my recent knee replacement. I do think it impacts our audience because one of the big reasons I finally agreed to go into the knife was because I was having a hard time shooting and hunting and doing all the other fun stuff I enjoy. Oh yeah, well, daily life was pretty awful too at times, but having to step away from all the hobbies I enjoy was the major deciding factor. For me, it all came to a head during a media event at Gunsight a couple of years ago. We were on the scrambler and the instructor said, kneel down, scoot over there, lay down behind the tree, etc., etc. And I couldn't. Like the gimpy grandpa that I am, I slowly wound my way through the course and did the best I could. But it was at that moment I knew surgery was in my future. If you've seen me ambulating over the last couple of years, I've borne a striking resemblance to Chester from the old Gunsmoke series. Guys being guys, most of my buddies would repeatedly point this out whenever I was trying to maneuver. Finally, it got to the point I was in constant pain and even walking 100 yards was a major event. I tried cortisone shots, which worked for a while, along with ice and a knee brace, but my surgeon pointed to my x-ray and said, you know, there's supposed to be cartilage right there in your knee, and you have none. It's not going to get any better. In my particular case, it was only the inside bearing surface of the left knee. The outside wasn't in great shape, but the inner had slowly worn away to nothing due to a combination of wear, an old injury, and the fact that if I ate any more pizza, I'd have to go down to the local grain elevator to get weighed. You know all those times when somebody tells you that you'll pay for youthful indiscretions? Well, they're absolutely correct. Damn it. I guess I'm in good company because I know lots of folks who have had similar knee replacements. In fact, here in my late 50s, I'd say a large percentage of my friends are walking around on various bionic knees and hips. But now, here's where I'll differ from what you might have heard yourself. All of my friends say, oh, knee surgery was great. I wish I'd done it 10 years earlier. Well, I heard that enough that I was sure I made the right decision and was looking forward to getting the surgery done so I could resume my life of carefree frolic. Well, let me say this to that. Horseshit. It might be wonderful here in six months, but right now at six weeks post-surgery, it's anything but wonderful. I guess I'd still have the procedure done because, frankly, I didn't have a choice. But don't let them kid you. It's a major league life event. I suppose it's like childbirth. If the rewards weren't so great and the pain didn't fade over time, nobody would have a second child. I had my surgery done at an internationally known hip and knee center near my house, and it went very smoothly. In fact, I was shocked to learn that my surgery would actually be considered outpatient. I arrived at the hospital at 6 a.m. and was headed home by 4 p.m. with a big bandage, lots of medication, and maybe just a bit of smugness after I realized, hey, this wasn't so bad, I handled it pretty well. 
I also thought the recovery was going to be a breeze and I'd be back doing yard work within a week. I actually thought that. I was convinced I'd be off the narcotics within three days and back to work in a week or so. By now, if you hadn't realized it, I'm unbelievably stupid. The day after surgery wasn't so bad. During the procedure, they use oral narcotics, a nerve block in your leg, a spinal block, and general anesthesia, all of which should be your first several clues that this is a major surgery. It turns out these things wear off at different times, and day one was actually pretty nice so long as you didn't ponder the fact they essentially cut your leg in half and reassemble it with what appears to be an ice cream scoop for a knee. At this point, let's refer back to some of my actual notes and emails. Day one. A time of great feelings and happiness. Mr. Bluebird was sitting on my shoulder whistling zippity doo dah. Surgery went well. I had no problems waking up and was headed home by late afternoon. I even started doing the recommended exercises to strengthen your knee and increase flexibility. Life was good. I was amazed at how tough I was. I can eat pain like candy and sneer openly. Who needs opiates? Day 2. I woke about 8 a.m. to pain. Serious pain. Pain like somebody was breaking your kneecap with an 8-pound sledgehammer every few minutes. Darn it, I forgot a pain pill during the night. Okay, no worries. I took the next pill. I can handle this. I then gently did my exercises and laid back down. I did notice there was some blood soaking through my dressing, but no problem, they said, to expect that. I pulled myself back up a few minutes later and looked down. The knee dressing, which is essentially a long adhesive diaper over the incision, was now half full of blood. That's a problem. We called the doc, and they said, get in here right now. At the surgeon's office, I saw his nurse practitioner, and she immediately tried to downplay the whole thing, at least until they stripped off the dressing. I immediately felt blood running down my leg in several major streams, and it was a lot of blood. The nurse practitioner looked at her nurse and said, hmm. You know, I don't like hearing hmm when just a handful of unhealed sutures is holding half my leg shut. The nurse looked concerned. The nurse practitioner said, um, go get me a big stack of four by four dressings. The nurse practitioner tried to recover her suave and commented, no worries, this is completely normal. But the look in her eyes told me a different story. It's kind of like when you hear, folks, this is the pilot speaking. Those flames and broken pieces you see shooting out of the engine are totally normal and expected. The big blue pad under my knee was quickly soaked in blood as the team poked and prodded. I was growing concerned because, frankly, that's a lot of damn blood. My blood. A few seconds later, the nurse practitioner prodded a bit more and then said, Aha! She found a bleeder and applied direct pressure. She did this for about five minutes, and thankfully the bleeding stopped. Of course, our own Will Dabbs MD reminded me later that all bleeding eventually stops one way or the other. I'll try to keep that in mind in the future. Anyway, with bleeding stopped, she applied a new adhesive diaper, patted me on the head, and we were headed home. After that point, I only had minor bleeding, so life was good. Day 2.5 all that poking and prodding hadn't caused spontaneous incontinence, so it was apparent the nerve block was still in place. It finally wore off the evening of day two. And let me say this. Screaming the worst, most vile four-letter words at the top of your lungs doesn't help with this kind of pain, though I tried it several times to make sure. My wife turned off her hearing aid, but since she reads lips, she gave me a disapproving look throughout the evening. Along the way in with all this activity, I had missed another pain pill during the night, and when I woke on day three, I would have literally punched my grandmother in the face in exchange for three minutes of reduced pain. Not even gone, just reduced. Sorry, Granny. This was my lost day. I made sure the pills and I didn't go more than arm's length apart, and I set 460 reminder alarms on my phone. I slept most of the day in the recliner, only getting up to make very slow, very painful trips to the bathroom. I will point out, if you have leg surgery, a recliner is your friend. I also had some really weird dreams during the cat naps, especially the one involving dinosaurs and my sister-in-law viciously arguing with sportscaster Dick Vitale. And that's a true story. Right here is where we need to discuss another well-known side effect of opiates. Trying to be delicate as possible, let me just say that laxatives are no laughing matter when you're taking painkillers. Using the best G-rated analogy I can come up with, on Friday, May 13th, 2022, without sedation or medical assistance, 
I gave birth to a UPS delivery truck. Day four. We had a little problem overnight. I set my alarms for the pills, and when the alarm went off at 11.30 p.m., I grabbed my water bottle and took another pain pill. Something didn't seem right, and once I fully woke up, I realized to my horror I had taken my opiate only an hour after the last one. My brain immediately flashed all the dead junkies I've had to bag and tag over the years, though I didn't really think one pill over the line was going to take me out. But then again, knowing my luck. I learned something that night. Bulimia is harder than it looks. Trying to purge the extra pill, I stuck my finger down my throat to the point I could feel the pasta I ate two days ago, but I still couldn't throw up. We called the ER, and they said just make sure he doesn't go to sleep. So, two horribly sleep-deprived people sat in our living room until 3 a.m., waiting to see if I'd stop breathing and die. At least the pain was okay, and I watched a fascinating documentary on the life of General William Tecumseh Sherman, one of my heroes. I never did get sleepy. Go figure. Day 5. I'm actually feeling slightly better. Serious pain pops up occasionally, but I've cranked back the drugs with each dose. At one point, I went six whole hours without a pill. But I decided I wouldn't be doing that again for a while. Day 6. I woke at 6 a.m. having to go to the bathroom. Right now. But unfortunately, getting out of bed is a process involving a winch, scaffolding, hearing protection, and several stevedores. As my wife gently, oh, gently, gently, sweet baby Jesus, gently, please, was moving my leg to the floor, it really hurt. Not in an ow kind of way, but more on the line with I was having thoughts of punching my grandmother again. The highlight of day six was my one-week checkup. After a bumpy 45-minute truck ride through six of the seven gates of hell, we finally arrived. Something to keep in mind is trucks are fantastic, except if you're going to see the doctor after recent leg surgery. If you think your spouse and yourself occasionally argue about directions when traveling, imagine a situation where one of you feels like a wood chipper is removing your leg, you're late, and neither one of you knows exactly where the office is located. It was F-U-N fun. Fortunately, as no homicide occurred and we are still married, I'd say our relationship has now been officially combat tested. Anyway, the doc was pleased with my progress and all is well. During our appointment, the nurse practitioner mentioned of all the surgeries their practice does, spine, hip, neck, shoulder, that knee surgery is clearly the most painful. I don't think they shared that little tidbit prior to surgery. At that point, I was having serious buyer's remorse. She did mention that such discomfort is normal, and it's not unusual to see people wiping the sweat off their brow at this first appointment. At one point, when I grabbed my wife's medical mask to wipe my own forehead, the nurse practitioner noted, I guess you are in pain. Now, at this point in the proceedings, we can fast forward a couple of weeks, because I simply was too exhausted from lack of sleep and didn't feel like committing any journalism. During this time, I pretty much lived in the recliner, my bed, and taking the occasional bathroom break. I did take sponge baths every couple of days, but the first shower at the two-week mark did feel like heaven. Now we're back to email from late May. Hey kids, I'm back at work. I thought I'd give you an update regarding my current status. Things are progressing slower than I anticipated, though I'm apparently right on schedule. Boy, did I have unrealistic expectations. I'm getting out of the recliner every couple of hours and walking around for a few minutes. Things are getting easier, but still sitting in the padded office chair in my desk is still pretty uncomfortable. Turns out I have a huge hematoma or bruise on my upper left leg slash butt from the tourniquet they use during surgery. The doc told me this causes almost as much discomfort as the surgery and he's right. I can't wait for it to heal. Pain has been here there and the typical two steps forward one step back kind of thing. I'm still pretty tired since I'm not sleeping well but the cat naps during the day are wonderful. Since that email, over the last couple of weeks, I've been making steady progress. I got rid of my walker at the beginning of week five and switched to a cane. Most of the time, I don't really need the cane, and I walk around the house without it. Physical therapy is as painful as everybody promised, but it has to be done if you want to get your range of motion back. I'm a little behind the curve there because we had trouble getting into rehab, uh, because it turns out staffing and supply chain issues aren't solely a problem for the restaurant and automotive industry. Otherwise, things are going okay. I can even ride a stationary bike, which falls under the heading of simple pleasures are the best. 
I'm doing lighthouse work, and unfortunately for all involved, I'm fully back to committing journalism. Well, except for my afternoon naps. I'm still healing, after all. The pain isn't too bad now. It's really more of a deep ache. I asked my doctor about this at the six-week checkup. Not because it's unbearable, but because I'm afraid I'm overdoing it, or there's some type of problem we need to fix before it gets out of hand. He said, you're fine. Let me show you something. He pulled up my latest x-rays and showed them to me. He said, you see this? It's a big spike I pound into the center of your lower leg bone. Then these three smaller spikes get pounded into solid bone itself as anchors. Plus, I cut off the end of your femur and fit this big round metal cap. Your bone is currently growing attached to all this. He then paused for effect and said, it's only been six weeks. You will have pain for a while. Okay, well, now that you've put it that way. I will say I'm glad I didn't see those pictures a few weeks earlier. And now for my final thoughts. Above all, looking back on the grand scheme of things and the overall benefits, it's worse than I thought. By far. A lot. Screw putting on a brave face. This was a test of epic proportion, and if anybody thinks I'm a wimp, good for them. I don't care. This turned out to be pure awful. Dipped in a rich, creamy, awful coating, rolled in crushed awful, and served with a large side order of damn it. Honestly, it's been tolerable, in the sense that throughout history, people have had arms and legs cut off without anesthetic, but it gave me a whole new perspective on pain. They're always asking about your pain on a scale of 1 to 10, and the highest I've ever said is, oh, well, probably 6 or 7. Turns out I was correct. I've now seen 10, and I don't want to go back. So the big question overall, was it worth it? Well, probably, likely, I suppose so. Just don't ask me right now. If you're facing this same procedure at some point, you'll be fine. Just don't expect the first few weeks to be a trivial walk in the park like I did. As I said, I'm stupid that way, so don't make the mistakes I did. You'll be out of commission at least four weeks, and it'll take six weeks before you realize the light at the end of the tunnel isn't a train. But I think I'll be fine, and in a year, I'll also be waxing poetic about my bionic knee, just like everybody else. And, besides, I've got a score to settle with a certain target out at gun sight. I hope I didn't discourage anybody from getting their knee fixed, but I hope I did give you a more realistic view of how it all works. As I said during the segment, I'm sure I'll be happy as a gun-toting clam when everything is finally healed up. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to the Guns Magazine podcast. Guns Magazine was first on the newsstand, and today we're bringing you the most interesting chats in the gun world. If you've got any questions or comments about the show, please email me. That would be editor at gunsmagazine.com. Make sure you subscribe to us on your favorite podcast directory, YouTube, and of course, you can always listen at gunsmagazine.com. And while you're online, don't forget to check out our great sister publications, American Handgunner Magazine at AmericanHandgunner.com, AmericanCop.com, and our numerous special editions available for sale on our websites. Most of all, while you're online, I'd also appreciate it if you would share a favorite episode or some kind words on your own social media. Well, that's it for this episode of the Guns Magazine podcast. For the entire staff at FMG Publications, I'm Guns Magazine editor Brent Wheat. Now get out there and get shooting. <laughs>